Someone in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. But he said to him, Friend, who set me to be a judge or arbitrator over you? And he said to him, Take care. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Then he told them parable. The land of a rich man produced abundantly. And he thought to himself, What should I do? For I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build larger ones. There I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, You fool. This very night, your life will be demanded of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So it is with those who store up treasures for themselves, but are not rich towards God. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray my kitchen aid to keep. I pray my stocks are on the rise, that my analyst is wise. I pray that all the wine I sip is white and that my hot tub's watertight, that racquetball won't get too tough, that all my sushi's fresh enough. I pray my cordless phone still works, that my career won't lose its perks, my microwave won't radiate, my condo won't depreciate. I pray my health club doesn't close, and that my money market grows. If I go broke before I wake, I pray my beamer they won't take. Well, I do not think that any of us would pray this tongue-in-cheek prayer with our lips. Many of us, truth be told, have probably prayed something similar in our hearts. Our relationship with our possessions is precarious, sticky, touchy, personal. And we all have them. If we live in this country, we have an abundance of possessions. Compared with the vast majority of the world, we are blessed with many possessions. The passage from our gospel today forces us to look at our lives and to ask What's really important in life? May West once quipped, You live only once, but if you do it right, once is enough. I didn't know May West was such a theologian, but I think she may be on to something. Jesus cautions us today that our relationship with our possessions can consume our life that possessions are blessings, but can quickly become something that possesses us. Okay, so let's set the stage for the gospel reading today. We're reading chapter 12, beginning at verse 13. But earlier in chapter 12, the crowd had gathered by the thousands, so many so that they trampled on each other, the text says. Jesus had spoken to the disciples and warned them, about the hypocrisy, the Pharisees. 
He was trying to instill in them the long view of life, to fear not the earthly powers who can kill the body, but fear the one who has the authority to cast into hell. He was teaching the crowds about the Holy Spirit and the Son of Man and how they should respect them as the driving forces and anchors of their earthly lives, a very deep and difficult teaching to grasp. He was trying to convey to them how precious they are in God's sight, how they should live their lives in eternal terms and not earthly terms. But then someone in the large crowd found a lull in the teaching. You know, one of those moments that ran a bit too long of silence and blurted out, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. Clearly, this man's mind was somewhere else. He was present, but he was not listening. Now, in all fairness, it was not uncommon to pose questions of judgment to rabbis of eminence in those days. But didn't he just hear the solemn and impressive words of Jesus? The utter worldliness of the man stands in stark contrast to the teachings of Jesus in the gospel. I have to know that the person didn't realize just who was in front of him. Jesus was not and is not one of those rabbis of eminence. Jesus' heritage was not derived from the judges of earlier times in Israel. Jesus' teachings and work were, was of another and higher kind. And so his answer to the guy was abrupt and had a tinge of rebuke. Friend, who set me to be a judge or arbitrator over you? Jesus realized, of course, the question for what it was, a question of earthly possessions and greed. And so he simply said that your life, addressing the crowd, is not made up of an abundance of possessions, and be on guard against all kind of greed. Then Jesus went back to teaching in higher and loftier terms, and he took and used this question of possessions and greed and taught the crowd in a parable. So what does this parable from Luke teach us about possessions in heavenly terms? What kinds of things does it teach us to look out for when our hearts begin to focus exclusively on ourselves and we begin to have a wrong relationship with our possessions? The first thing it teaches when we focus only on ourselves, we do not give God the credit for the things he has done. Then he spoke a parable to them, saying, The land of a rich man produced abundantly. Jesus spoke of a man who was rich, a man who had honestly earned what he possessed. He didn't have a problem with that. Jesus was speaking of a man who was leaving God out of the picture. He was speaking of a man who was saying to himself, Look at what I have done. Look what my fields have yielded. Look at me and my wonderful problem. Where was God in the picture? The fact that he was a steward over all that God had given him. The fact that God had blessed him with a good crop, free of blight and disease. The fact that God had blessed him with such an abundance that his cup overfloweth, that his barns could not uh, any longer hold all that God had given him, this man was not giving God any credit for the things God had done. The second thing it teaches, when we focus only on ourselves, we make plans, but we leave God out. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? since I have no room to store my crops. So he said, I will do this. 
will pull down my barns and build greater ones, and there I will store all my crops and my goods. There was nothing wrong with the man's desire to build more barns. It was probably a good and prudent idea. The problem lies in the fact that there is not any thought of sharing his abundance with others. It's interesting to note that in the parable, the personal pronoun my occurs four times and I occurs five times. The rich man says, my crops, my barns, my goods. There is no thought to putting God into his life and all his plans, he has left God out. The third thing the parable teaches when we focus on ourselves, we consider spending our resources only on ourselves. And I will say to my soul, so you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. In this verse, the rich man is talking to himself and assessing his future physical well-being. The man thought that when he put his plan into action, that he would have it made for years to come. He was convinced that his future would continually expand under his control. Nothing could be further from the truth. He was beginning to show the traits of a fool. The fourth thing this parable teaches when our hearts are focused on ourselves, we store our treasures in the wrong places. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded of you. <clears throat> and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? God is calling this rich man a fool. In Scripture, a fool is one who leaves God out of any consideration. In Psalm 14, it says, The fool has said in his heart, There is no God. People become fools when they begin to think that all that they are, all that they accomplish, all that they possess, is because of their doing and not gifts from God. When we leave God out of our lives, the seven deadly sins are the inevitable result, and one of these deadly sins is greed. But as we have already seen, Jesus does not have a problem with us owning possessions. That is one way God blesses our lives. It is rather how we think about and how we manage our possessions that makes the difference. And finally, the fifth thing this parable teaches when we begin to focus only on ourselves, we will find ourselves in conflict with God's plan for our life. So it is with those who store up treasures for themselves but are not rich toward God. Riches have one major weakness. They have no purchasing power after death. All our earthly riches will do us no good once all we own is a very small plot of ground. We can't take a suitcase full with us. The Egyptians tried that. They packed chambers full of all manner jewels and gold, food, weapons, and everything in between. It is our duty, therefore, as followers of Jesus, to live our lives in such a way that we will deposit treasures in heaven. The riches of the earth are for the earth. They will not do us any good unless they are used to build up the kingdom of God, to build up the church to help people come to the knowledge of God's all-inclusive love for them, to bring others to the belief that giving is better than getting, 
to help others understand that God blesses the giver and places treasures in his house for the righteous person. Until we can come to this realization, we have not brought God into our lives. We have not opened our eyes to what Jesus taught, and we are not living the Christian way. Last week, we learned how to pray according to Jesus' teaching. We didn't learn to pray for possessions. We learned to pray for thy will be done. So give the hot pursuit of possessions a rest. Don't pray to God for a resolution to an earthly possession issue. Don't pray to God for a resolution to a problem which will only impact you. Pray, rather, for a change of heart for yourself or for someone else, which will impact far more than a specific problem or issue. Pray for the Holy Spirit to guide you in all that you do. Pray for a double portion of God's wisdom and peace. Pray for things eternal, not for things temporal. Pray for thy will be done through you and by you and in you. And pray for these things persistently so as to mean it. If you are a young person, pray for these things persistently and build a life that is not only fun, but will use the blessing of possessions in a way that will give God glory and be deeply rewarding. If you're not so young, Pray for these things persistently, because while time is limited, it is never too late to be a blessing and a ray of hope to someone in this incredibly needy world. Possessions are powerful blessings, but at the end of the day, they're temporal. They're not eternal. And so, End your day acknowledging as much with a prayer that is eternal and could go something like this. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. If I should live for other days, I pray the Lord to guide my ways. Father, unto thee I pray. Thou hast guarded me all day. Safe I am while in thy sight. Safely let me sleep tonight. Bless my friends. The whole world bless. Help me to learn helpfulness. Keep me ever in thy sight. So to all, I say good night. You only live once. But if you do it right, once is enough, Mae West said. Yes, indeed. <laughs>